Give me, put me a seat. Down. All right. Uh, good morning. We are the First Baptist of Jefferson Town, and it is such a great day to be alive and well. Thank you all for watching and worshiping with us. We are located on the corner of 1600 Waterston Trail. And if you're watching via the website or via Facebook, we invite you to share this video on your pages right now and just worship with us. The first song that we're gonna do is called Praise the Lord. And we invite you wherever you are to praise the Lord with us. Amen.
might have a little church right now. God is my everything. Wherever you are, you can put your hands together and praise the Lord with us. we find our scripture reading in Isaiah chapter 43 verses 1 to 4 I'm reading from the New King James Version 
of the Bible. This is how it reads. But now, thus saith the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, they shall, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for your, for your place, since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you, and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east, and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you today for your word. Your word is truth because, Lord, there is no any standard of truth in this world, in heaven, under the earth that is actually the standard but the standard is you father because you are the god of truth we thank you that we can hear a lot of truths lord oh god but we know that we have the truth because we have believed that jesus is the truth the life and the way and we thank you that we can know the truth and this truth sets us free. We thank you, Father, for your word. Your word affirms to us today that you have redeemed us, that we belong to you, and that we belong to nobody, to no any other entity in this world and in the world to come. We belong to you because you redeemed us. You bought us with that precious price, Lord, the blood of Jesus. And today we know we're not our own, because not only do we belong to you, but you live in us. We thank you that you have honored us to be the temple, the living temple of the living God. We love you for that, Heavenly Father. We're not worthy, but we thank you that you have redeemed us with the blood. And that blood, Lord, has cleansed us and made us children of God and made us holy. We can stand here today and say, yes, Lord, I am redeemed but with a price. We are coming today, Lord, in that consciousness, and we know that you are not only with us, but you are in us, and we pray that this service will glorify your name again, because you are a God who brings the glory back to yourself. We commit your word to you. We, we commit the heart of the one, Lord, who's going to bring your word to you, her mind, her heart, her body, Lord, we know that you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all what we can ask or thank. Because your purpose, Lord, is fulfilled not only yesterday, not only today, but eternally. And we pray that you will bless, Father, this gathering. That, Lord, you will please, Lord, let us know that when you have redeemed us, Lord, and you called us from all places and brought us back to yourself in the name of Jesus. So we commit this service to you. We pray that everything, Lord, will be felt. Lord, in, in a sense that we will know that and everybody will know that we are not alone, that we are living and walking with a holy, powerful, all-knowing God, the holy God of Israel. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who said with us, I am with you always even to the end of this age and to that we say yes lord and we say amen in jesus name amen
Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will choose to rejoice, and we will be glad in it. By way of announcements, we just ask that you would continue to keep our church family in prayer. We ask that you would uh, pray for Sister Victoria Coverson's father-in-law, who is recovering from a fall. We ask for continued prayer for Sister Kathy Corbett, a continued recovery, and then continued prayer for Sister Tasha Stark, Sister Katrina Hill, Sister Carolyn Harris, Sister Minnie Kennard, Sister Leona Parker, and Brother John Riley. Also, by way of announcements, um, the um, ministry, outreach ministry, is seeking volunteers that are needed for the back to school drive through giveaway, and that will be September the 12th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. We're asking that you please contact Deacon Paul Jones and Deacon Greg Downs for the types of donations needed, and then for more information, this is, this is included in the news brief. Also, Sister uh, Kristen Robinson is collecting folding tables and chairs for students for this school year for the NTI. And to see how you can help, this is, uh, information is also located in the news brief, or you can email at ethelsprodigy at gmail.com. Also, the bylaws info and update, the church bylaws and operations manual will be available at the church and by email. Membership review and submit any questions by August the 31st, and then questions will be addressed on September the 1st. Also, the uh, Girls Ministry has an upcoming Zoom meeting this coming Saturday, and Minister Tawana Shanklin will be their speaker. So this information and other information can be found in this week's news brief. Thank you. Just before the preacher comes, we're going to do a couple selections. The first one that we're going to do is an old Hawkins classic called God is Standing By.
to sing another song. This song is called Won't It Be Sweet. And it looks forward to that day when all of us, all that have uh, gone before us and all that have passed away, and even those, actually, I just think of a scripture that says, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the trump of God, the voice of an archangel. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we that are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. And won't it be a great day when all of God's saints come together once again? All those that have gone on, as I said, we'll be able to see them again. And then, of course, more than anything, we'll be able to see the face of Jesus in peace. Hallelujah. I mean, I think about this. This one goes out to all those. This is a crazy time for us, of course, just with the coronavirus. It's affected a lot of things. I think I just lost an uncle, actually less than two days ago, for example. And um, yeah, this song is just something to encourage you that Amen. there will be a better day. to cry no more what a celebration when we finally reached the other shore but I don't need a mansion I'm not worried about streets of gold just let me talk to Jesus, the one who died to save my soul. Won't it be sweet? Won't it be right? When we see Jesus, when we take flight, oh, won't it be? Won't it be? Won't it be? talk to my mother shout about the love of Christ show her that I made it tell her how he changed my life I can kiss my Savior Feel the scars in his hand. Love my wife and children. Over in that battered land. Study my salvation. Learn about his perfect plan. Me up some wings yes, sir. Yes, sir. so I can fly. Yes, 
just like a dove, yeah. Won't it be sweet? Won't it be? Won't it be right? Won't it be right? When we see Jesus, when we take flight, oh, oh, won't it be? Won't it be? Won't it be? Won't it be? Won't it be a dream come true? Won't it? Won't it be more than a dream come true when we actually see Jesus, and we will see him with our naked eye. Right now we love him, but we haven't seen him. We don't see him. We see him in, by faith. But a day will come when we will really see him face to face. We thank the Lord for the Lord's keeping and care and that God continues to control his world. Nothing happens to the world without God's knowing, not just knowing, but he's in charge. We are all talking about the corona that is killing thousands, millions of people all over the world. Death is real. But for us who believe death is an exit from this place into a better place where we will see Jesus and stay there with him, watching his face. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you. We praise you. We acknowledge your being our Father and our God. We thank you that you are in charge, you are in control of the entire universe. But Lord, you have in your plan to listen to the prayers of your children, to accept our worship. Lord, may we be found to be those who are worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Open our hearts, open our minds, and let your spirit flow through us all, Lord. We thank you that you promised us that when we pray according to your will, you hear us and you grant us our requests. We thank you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Now today, I would like, if the Lord permits, to give some glimpse of what is happening in relation to our faith. We who are saved, who have received Christ into our lives, are waiting, are in a waiting room. We are waiting almost on tippy toes for that day when Christ will come and then we will see him face to face and we will see some of our loved ones who have gone to be with the Lord. And we are going to use for today as our tests 
the first Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. There, Paul writes these words. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of the men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Thank you. Now, um, the second coming of Christ is a doctrine, a Christian teaching that most, the majority of the Christian thought agree on. We all know that once we receive the Lord into our lives, we are in a waiting area, we are ready to meet our Savior in person. Many of us sometimes quibble here and there about the logistics of how and what the times mean in the prophecies. But the one thing is, all Christendom is waiting in anticipation. We all agree that one of these days, soon and very soon, says Andrew Crouch, we will see the Lord. We talk about the Christ who was the only human being who was 100% human, like you and us, but also he was fully 100% divine. No other person had ever been like that, and no other will ever be like that. That was God in person who arrived here during his first advent. He came here to show us the way, to show us how to live for God as human beings, but oh, not only so, but to open the way through his death so that we can be ushered into the kingdom. John uh, 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning, the word was with God. The, the word was God. And the word became flesh in verse 14. So that is when God himself moved into our neighborhood. He became like us. And John says, we touched him, we heard him, we saw him with our naked eyes. And he came so that we, each person can be restored to the original state of being. When God created human beings, God created us to have an unmediated relationship with him. God created us to know that we can live in a perfect world. Unfortunately, our foreparents cut that perfection uh, short, but the restoration of that uh, being is what God, here, Jesus had come here to do. But when he comes back, it will be a different story altogether. He has demonstrated, and many people are demonstrating now, those who are alive continue the mission of helping us all to grow and become what God wants us to do. Now, the first coming of Christ happened exactly as the Bible, the prophets, all of them from different walks of life had predicted and prophesied. There was nothing missing in there. Therefore, we can confidently, we do confidently expect that God will again 
true to God's nature, fulfill the promise of bringing all those who have slept, who are died in the Lord. He will bring them back. And then he will usher all Christians once for all in eternity. Eternity will be real, will be tangible. We will be walking in there and never to get out again. Now what is the second coming of Christ? It is a promise taught in scripture, all over the scripture. It is going to be a one-time event. It will not be a process, but a one-time event that will be visible to all. And it is stated in the Bible always as when the Lord comes back, not if or just in case, because it is a certain certainty that is going to happen. And in, in numerous, all the information that we have about the second coming, one thing is unknown, is the exact time. It is going to take place, but God has kept that to himself, the when. And when Christ talked about his coming, the disciples asked, you know, the human question, the burning question for most humans is, when will this happen? But what did Christ do? He gave them the showing shortlist, the signs that will happen. In Luke 21, he says, verse 25, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, at that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. What a day that will be. Where we read Paul only focuses on the logistics of what is going to happen. But in Matthew 24 is another explicit step, you know, manifold uh, example, some of the things that will happen. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that there'll be various signs all over the place. We will see them. People who don't believe in him will see them. And they will be in every way before the grand finale when Christ himself comes in person. He said in verse five, many will claim to be Christ. We see that today. Some of us who preach the word have dabbled in trying to replace Christ. Some have actually verbalized, which is dangerous, uh, that they have done more than Christ. Some people distort the believers, some followers, to say, if you give me this money, I am the one that will deliver the blessings. Then he says, not only many will do that, will claim to be Christ, but they will deceive many. Now that's the times that we are living in. We are inching closer to the end of this age. Because so many people are deceived. John, in First John says, there will be many antichrists near the end. Don't we see them today? They come in multitudes. And some of them mimic Christ so that people can be fooled and think that, well, this is Christendom. This must be going. And then it says again, there will be wars and rumors of wars. Every day we hear about nuclear issues just unrest internationally, globally. There are things that are happening, national conflicts, famines. Isn't that something? Even in the United States, so much food, so much wealth, so much money. There are people who go to bed hungry, not because they don't have what they would like to eat, but because it's a reality. We don't even talk about the other parts of the world where people know when they say they are hungry, they don't mean it is lunchtime. 
they mean my stomach is growling because it, it is empty. He says earthquakes will be widespread, even places that used never to have earthquakes. When we were in South Africa six years ago, we had snow in South Africa, which is unbelievable because we grew up there and the, the most snow we saw was two inches. And then as soon as the sun rises, it, 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 it melts away. But say, the times are ripe. Christ warned us. And then in verse 8 says, these will only be the beginnings because many, many of the believers will fall away. That, that worries me. That concerns me. You know, this term that many doesn't mean uh, the, a handful. It almost implies the majority, that we are in danger. Uh, many of the believers are in danger of being apostate, of turning away from the Lord. And then it says, we will betray. Those who turn away from the Lord will betray and hate each other. Wow, how much hate exists? How much hate do we exhibit? Just as the churches in general, we are people of faith, we believe in the one God in three persons, but all the squabbles that we have. And then you bring that down to the everyday people. Ever since I have lived in the United States, I have never seen the level of hatred as elevated as it is now. And it is the signs of the times. Because, Jesus says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow old. Something happens when wickedness and evil expounds. There is a danger of, that it, of impacting us so that our love for the Lord is not as fiery as it used to be. That even our waiting, we focus so much on this place. You know, the faith has changed. Many people now talk about, oh, the Lord has given me a car and a house, and as if we are going to be here forever. We might be here for the next 100 years, but we may not be. So we need to be thinking about the Lord. And then Paul, later on, in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, again tells us what is going to happen when Christ comes. He just goes over that this, as much as we know that Christ is going to come, it is also mysterious. It is not totally human. We cannot completely understand it, comprehend it with human intelligence. But he says, the basics I can tell you, that flesh... These bodies are not going to inherit, it, inherit the kingdom of God. These bodies are going to be transformed. The perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. But then again, like he says in Thessalonians, not all of us will be asleep. But he says, but all of us will be changed. I like that. It's going to happen suddenly, instantaneously. When, we, when Christ comes and we are caught up to be with him, what a change it will be. Some of us who are already having slow, uh, going in slow motion, we will be going real fast there because these bodies of corruption would have won, taken over the incorruption. But again, while we are waiting, what is happening? And Paul writes to Timothy and says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, this happening of Christ, coming of Christ again, is going to happen in a serious context. He says uh, to Timothy, chapter 3, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, considered, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, <clears throat> having a form of godliness but denying the power of. 
You know, when I read these scriptures, I think I can attach names of people I know. I can attach my name to some of those things, the happenings that makes these times, the last days, to be terrible, horrible, very bad days. These are the days that we live in. We see that self-love is all at an all-time high. Never have human beings be self, so self-confident, so in, uh, imaginative, so brilliant, so and even dabbling in the spiritual issues and challenging God. We are at an all-time high. Do we love money? Look at all the scams. Most of the crimes, 90% of the crimes committed have a money angle to them. They also have um, um, and the angle of being boastful, trying to get what you don't have so that you can impress the people who don't care about you. The lack of love, it breaks my heart every night here in our city. People don't die. People are murdered. What happened to humanity? My people say Ubuntu. That which exhumes from you when you see another person. Just to talk to them is that something happens to you. Just to be able to meet their needs does something to you. But what has happened? This is bad time. Then look at the abuse. You know, they used to be, when I grew up, we didn't know about spousal abuse, child abuse, but these things today, they are every day table talk because it is the last days. Not only do we abuse as individuals, people in leadership, many governments abuse their power. They abuse their resources that God has given for his creation, only a few are enjoying them up there. That is not good. And then we won't even go about to disobedient to, to parents. Now the parents are listening to the children. That is a total role reversal. It should not be, it doesn't work right. And people are ungrateful. You know, there is a form of greed that's inherent in all of us. You have but you want more than what you have. I have never been wealthy, but I have heard that even those people who are real wealthy, who have money coming out their ears, they can do anything. They want more. There's always that desire. We are not grateful. May the Lord help us. Teach us, Lord, to be thankful for what we have. People are, la are without love. They are colors. You know, we see now the police brutality is out in the open, not just here, but throughout the world. A human being knows that I am murdering another human like me. More than that, a person that's created in God's image, but they go ahead and do it. Not only the police, but families. People get married, everything is nice, and then, that love turns into hate. Terrible, terrible times that we live in. Another big one, unforgiving. You know, this is a huge one because it's not just people in the world, but it's us. It is very permanent. It is prevalent, rather, among the believers. It is hard for us to forgive, even though we know that God says, when we pray, we say, Lord, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. When I was preparing this message, I started thinking about some people that I have not forgiven. I have kind of put them on the back burner. When we first came to the United States, we had two homes. Five years later, we went back. Both had been stolen. One of those people, that realtor, was one of those people that I have pierced with this unforgiveness. Not only do we lack forgiveness, 
we need God's help. There are times when we, it doesn't take just human intellect or good will, but we need God's help. And then people slander. Wow. You know how some people thrive? They feed on saying the bad things about others. That is why when we hear, look at the news, we watch something in us said, wow, I'm not that bad. Look at so-and-so. We slander. We are without self-control. That's another big one. It comes with maturity most of the time, humanly, but the real comes with God working in us. The one that is, is a tragedy, it says we have the form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Again, I'll use the United States as 80% of people living in the United States. They say they are Christians. We say we are believers. We say we love the Lord. The Lord lives in our hearts. But do we? Is God demonstrating that power in our everyday lifestyles? Do we experience the power of God in our lives? Do people see in us that this is what godliness should be? Lord, help us. James 5 says, the coming of the Lord comes, takes time. So we have to be patient. He uses the metaphor of a farmer. When you plant a seed, it doesn't take days or a few hours. It takes weeks before it starts to germinate. He says, because... We are waiting for the Lord. We need to have that mentality. Don't rush, because our rushing is not going to do anyway. Then there are the other side to this uh, coming of the Lord. There are those who scoff. You know, some of them are in our workplaces. Some of them are members of our families. They say, wow. Do you know how long you've been saved, Susan? This scripture, this Bible has been there for centuries saying that Jesus is going to come back again. It's not going to happen. Do you know what? They just scoff because they are ignorant of what God is doing. God doesn't go according to our clock. God's clock is different from ours. He actually says, Peter says, God is waiting, waiting for each one, each person in the universe to come back to him, to be reconciled. That's why. One of the reasons why he's delaying, he's not just coming, he would have come by now. But oh, the love of God, he's patient so that many will go with him. In Thessalonians, what we read, Paul dispels ignorance. You know, Paul, if you read most of his writings, he can't stand this thing of not knowing. Ignorance is kind of, he is kind of allergic to it. Many times he says, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. You should not be uninformed about this. He says here, we should not be uninformed about death. You know, so much death all around us, especially now. Have you stopped? I have stopped a few times and asked myself, I wonder how many of the million, more than a million humans have died. They don't have a chance of making things right again. But do they know the Lord? How many do of them? I've lost three cousins in all, and we, lose, we lost a niece this Friday. And I always have to say, Lord, you give everybody a chance. I pray that they had that chance. So Paul says, when that happens, I like this scripture. He says that what will actually happen, he says, re remember that my information is based on what the Lord said. And then he says, the Lord himself, the Lord in person, is going to come down from heaven. We are going to see him come down. He is not going to be sending angels anymore like he sent them to tell Mary that he's going to give birth to Jesus as a baby. 
Now he's not coming back as a baby or who is going to be the savior of the world. He's coming back as a judge. And he said he will not just silently come. He will come with a loud command, the voice of an archangel, the trumpet call of God. In other words, it will be a trumpet call that will be obviously supernatural, obviously transcendent, obviously of God. Everybody will know this is not just a trumpet call. That will be a trumpet call when our Savior will be coming to call us home. Oh, won't it be sweet? It will be better than sweet. I don't know a better a way than that. It will be wonderful. And then he says the dead will rise first. You know if the Lord was going to come right now, wow. Some of the people that have passed, uh, Dr. Riley, Brenda, uh, Barbara Atkins, um, Deacon um, Weaver, Wow, they would be coming back. I don't know if we will see them, you know, coming, but they will be raised first, and then they will come down to fetch us all. And then the Lord will not wait for us to come down, but he's going to raise us all. And we are going to meet the Lord. We are going to meet the Lord. This is a good offer. It surprises me that sometimes it took me 17 years to maybe 15 because five of them I didn't really know anything about the Lord. But it took me long to understand this is a good offer, a very good offer. To be offered to bypass the pain of death, to bypass God's judgment, to be ushered into the kingdom of God. What a privilege. It is possible, it is going to happen, that we will meet the Lord. In the air, wow. Most of us have been in the air, in the airplane. Not this time. This flight is going to be millions of human beings that will take a flight at the same time. Right now, they take their flights at different times. But at, on that day, we are all going to be going. One flight leading to eternity. And Paul says, from then on, eternity will have been ushered in. We will be like children, maybe touch and feel and sense the presence of God forever. In the true meaning of the word forever. John says in 1 John 3 verse 3, those who have this hope in them. He says, let me tell you this. You know, John is the one that writes to us that he lived, he knows the Lord, he touched uh, him, and he lived with him. He saw him firsthand. And then he says, we know that when Christ comes, we are going to be like him. And he says, right now, soon as you receive Christ, you are a child of God. It's a transformation that we don't see with the naked eye, but it changes because it brings the God of the universe into a human body, and God lives there and starts to change you. Some people, uh, they, that the conversion is very dramatic because of what we knew there before, but really, it, for all of us, it's a major transformation. When God comes and lives in you, it says right now, we are the children of God. But he says, you know, it doesn't really, it's not quite obvious yet. All of us have jobs. All of us eat. All of us get angry. All of us sin every now and then. But when he comes, what a difference. We are going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Can you imagine? We can count the twinkling of an eye. And then we will look around and say, I don't know if I will, and say, wow. I love this body that the Lord has prepared. I don't know. But if we are going to be changed. I think we will be able to recognize each other. And my husband will be changed. My grandchildren are probably watching now. My son, my daughter, both of my sons, all those people, some of whom we have just touched, the Lord has used 
to have our little fingerprints to help them in the faith. All oh, those people, we will be able to see them there and see the Lord. What a day. What a day. What a day. It is sure coming. Let us, John says, sanctify ourselves. Don't just relax in this waiting room. Work and allow the Holy Spirit of God to prepare you, to fix you, so that when the Lord comes, we are not shamed, we are not ashamed of who we are, of the things that we have done, of how we've ignored this major gift that God has given us. It is a real promise. It's an offer. It's going to happen. Now I'm thinking there are people who may be listening and thinking, wow, I didn't know all that. Or more importantly, what you should be asking yourself is, do I know the Lord? Like Paul says, we believe that Christ came and lived exactly as he did, and he died so that you and I will not taste death. And he was raised by God. He's in heaven right now, interceding and talking on our behalf. If you are that person who is not sure, you can be sure. You can communicate. God is everywhere present. But listen to God's voice and say, Lord, I believe. Some people have said, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me to believe so that I can become your child. This is not a, an option. It's very crucial that each human being, once you are born here, you are a candidate for death. When you die, where are you going to spend eternity? Every human being has an eternal quality about them. Choose now where you are going to spend that eternity. It's up to you. Everyone can. And it's not something to be ashamed of. Actually, you should be proud of, wow, now I can be born again. It is huge. It's a major obedience to God. It's, it's going to change your whole life. Before that decision, you did not belong to God. But as soon as you say, Lord, I receive you, wow, God is faithful. He comes and resides in you. So while we are waiting, you are not just waiting and thinking, oh my Lord, if the Lord comes today, I have unfinished business. No, we'll be waiting in tippy toes. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Our Father, thank you that you are the God of the universe. You created this world out of nothing. And you created everything in this world just with your word, because your word is powerful. You further, Lord, recreated human beings in your own image. Oh, Lord, you did it. You put us in a perfect environment. And then we were deceived. Our four parents were, and they gave it all up. But, oh, Lord, thank you that you did not leave us to our own, on our own then. You still give us an offer. You send your son so that he can show us the way. He came here, and he lived with us and obeyed you fully so that we can learn how to obey. And yet, Lord, he did die and died a cruel death so that we, whoever believes in him, will not taste death. We will die from this world, but we will be asleep just waiting for you to come back. Lord, please, we pray that you will create in us the hunger the appetite, and the whatever it takes for us to understand your word, to receive your word, as the Thessalonians did, not as just good speeches or good sermons, 
but your word. Your word is alive. It gives us, Lord, the power to live for you. We thank you. We thank you so much, Lord, for the service that we have heard this day. In other parts of the world, it is evening for others. But all over the world, your children and your people have been crying unto you. Lord, we pray that you will work in our lives, that you will continue to do your work in the world. Even so, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord. Amen. <laughs>